Good afternoon, everyone, both at church and at home. Um, Chris says that people always say he needs no introduction, and that's true. So Chris King is going to tell us about organising philately in the United Kingdom the first hundred and so years. How far are we? <laughs> um, and the problems and uh, exciting uh, prospects. Well, I hope you can all see me, or we'll better still see the screen. Today's my wedding anniversary, and my wife's sitting in the audience. And the day we got married, 51 years ago, at about this time, she was sitting in the back of a dusty church hall in Belsize Park while I was doing a rehearsal for a play. So here we are 51 years later, and she's sitting in not quite such a dusty location, less in the audience. And uh, my apologies, I'm sorry. This is a presentation about organized philately. Organized philately has been a bit of a Cinderella in terms of the study of philatelic history. And I'm, <laughs> no, it is impossible so. actually to tell the story because no. the records are relatively thin. So what I'm going to do is to take you through some of the points, take you through some of the events in the last 150 years, some of the artifacts, some of the journals, some of the magazines, some of the sources for information. And I'm going to conclude by saying that we need to know an awful lot more um, because it really is, I think, perhaps the second most neglected area of study in philatelic history. I think the history of the trade is another one. Where there's an enormous gap in what's going on. Uh, some of the slides have got a lot of words on, and I'm going to go through them very quickly. I'm going to go through them very quickly because you're going to be able to download this PowerPoint if you're particularly interested and read them for yourself. So, it's called Organising Philately in the United Kingdom, the first 150 years. And as I think you'd all agree, the history of philately is a relatively new subject. Our museum here at the Royal was only christened the Museum of Philatelic History in the last five years. Um, there are very few museums of philatelic history in the world. Um, and a lot of basic research, as I said earlier, remains undone. And we don't even really have an easy framework to work around to give us direction. And clubs and societies were, have been legion in Britain. And some of them have disappeared without trace. And I recently had a question um, here at the Royal, which is when did the society in Bude Cornwall begin? Uh, it's not possible to find it. I didn't even know that it existed. We can't answer the simple question is how many societies were there in Great Britain? David Beach, who's sitting here in the audience, has compiled a very useful bibliography. And, and I would say insofar as it goes, David. <laughs> and it's, it's, it is a very helpful beginning. And the latest version is from this August. But what happened at BL in 2004, and I don't know that history either, was they compiled a series of short histories, which is a really good starting point uh, from 2004. But it's only about 40 societies. And only about 150 societies are mentioned in this, um, in this uh, document. And it's actually quite complicated because then you discover, once you start looking into this, that there have been at least three Bristol societies, at least three different Tunbridge Wells societies. And I'm beginning to suspect there were four Brighton societies in history. And, you, you know, people will write the history even now of the Brighton Society and they'll pick a starting date, which is probably later than the actual starting date. So, it is our intention in the museum and library here to try to rectify the absence of our own history. 
but I think it's not going to be quick. So I'm going to show you the kind of material that exists and the kind of material that we're interested in, and I'm going to try to do it in the context of organized philosophy. But I'm the first to admit that we're just scratching the surface of a vast subject. And not only are we scratching that surface, but that surface, that surface is actually beginning to fade in many places. And it's in danger of vanishing from the philatelic record. The number of societies that have disposed of their, um, their own records. I was having a conversation this morning about a society in Kent, uh, which is thinking of giving us their modern records here at the Royal, so we can preserve them. But actually all of its earlier records have been disposed of. And very often these records vanish when the secretary changes. And it, it's a very, very, very hard subject to, to pin down and many gaps and many questions remain. But I want to take you back to 1861. This is before organized society, but not actually before there was a prototype stamp club meeting at the rectory of All Hallows in Staining, or, or sorry, All Hallows Staining um, in the city of London. And here in the dotted line across the city of London at the bottom, you can see the Royal at Abchurch Lane on the far left-hand side. And if you follow that route um, to, uh, to Mark Lane uh, on the eastern side, um, you'll find the rectory of uh, All Hallows Staining and the tower still survives. And really, this is one of the places, that's an earlier engraving, um, where organized philately began. Because as uh, Percy de Worms said in 1919, in this quiet nook of the busy city, five or six, and I think it was actually seven, earnest collectors were accustomed to foregather at the weekend half a century since to bring their books to examine and compare novelties and acquisitions. And these people were Francis John Stainforth, uh, quite an old man at the time, um, 64, uh, Fred Philbrick, who was, um, well, there he is, he's 26 years old. Uh, Mr. Mount Brown, born 1837, so he's 30, he's not even 30, is he? He's 24. Um, Charles Viner, who I think claims to have been in the queue in 1840 to pick up a copy of the first postage stamp for, for the purpose of collecting. Henry Hazlitt, again, another young man. Mr. William Hughes Hughes, 1817. And Sir Daniel Cooper, who was the first president of the Royal. But these gentlemen, all gentlemen, um, did meet at weekends in the city of London to study postage stamps. They never made a formal club um, and all of them except Stainforth uh, survived to see the foundation of the Philatelic Society London in 1869. And through the journals, which really began in earnest in 1863, um, in those early years before 1869, there were various calls for the creation of a stamp club, stamp society. And the very useful 1819 history of the Royal um, from Percy de Worms has 26 references referencing those early calls to create a philatelic society. Um, it's in the library. You can find it to buy occasionally. It's not easy to find necessarily, um, but it does give an insight into the early years of organized philately. Um, so here we are, again, before organized philately, you've got the Stamp Collector's Magazine. And this is an extract from a tale of a postage stamp. And you can read, the clock over the postage, uh, over the post office in Lombard Street pointed to five. The usual two or three hours block at each end of that busy thoroughfare no longer existed. And the bankers and merchants of the neighborhood might be seen speeding homewards in substantial looking equipage hailing cab or omnibus, or taking a constitutional on foot. Lombard Street, for those of you who don't come here, 
is actually about 100 yards less um, from here going north. And you, you have there the site of the Lombard Street Post Office, uh, which was founded post the Great Fire of London and lasted until the reorganization of the city streets in about 1820. And he goes on to write, an uninitiated observer could have comprehended that, but he would have been at a loss to account for the gradual congregation of individuals of all ages under the arches and in the courts connecting the rich street of the bankers with Birchin Lane. This is a picture of Birchin Lane today, I hasten to add. Uh, one of which was named years ago from its proximity to the Great Exchange, but without the slightest anticipation of the peculiar appropriateness of the designation in the middle of the 19th century, Change Alley. Change Alley, 18th century. Change Alley, 20th century, not so very long ago. And that is less than 10 minutes walk from here. And the majority of this crowd, especially the juvenile portion of the gathering, were holding thin books of various sizes, which they were assiduously pressing on the attention of the numerous passers-by, most of whom seemed to have taken that way for the purpose, and silver and copper, nay, sometimes gold, passed from hand to hand in all directions. This was the then flourishing stamp exchange, and the curious observer would have been amused at the varied aspect of the component parts and the conversation of the detached groups. Um, so we have very close to here uh, an assembly, if you like, of collectors in the early 1860s, but still no organized fanatically. Later on in 65, uh, there's a proposal to organize exchange in Manchester. And uh, the Stamp Collectors magazine is very sniffy about it and says that the romance of Birchin Lane and Change Alley or the Tuileries Gardens where they had the same sort of thing or the Boulevard Sebastopol or the courtyard of the post office of Turin will never see that kind of post a postage stamp exchange again. Where do we find out about the early years of Philately, of stamp societies and of philatelic societies, philatelic clubs? This is the British newspaper library, and it worth um, worth worth its uh, worth its annual uh, subscription. And here I've searched for stamp society, and you can see between 1800 and 1849 there were 18 references, nothing to do with stamp societies. In the last half of the uh, 19th century, there were 190. And 1900 to 1949, 231, and then it falls away. So you can see from 2000 to 2021, there are two references. But these references in the British Newspaper Library are worthwhile looking up. And you can see there um, a reference from 1935 of the Bead School Philatelic Society. The Bead School Philatelic Society is not in the list that we have compiled so far. And I didn't know until I did this search, that it actually existed. Uh, and the Aberdeen Stamp Society below, which we probably recognize. But that large number there is interesting. And here, another search for philatelic society. And this is fascinating because in the latter half of the 19th century, 1089 references, 1900 to 1949, over 11,000. 1950 to 1999, um, the best part of 10,000, and rather fewer, 2000 to 2021. Um, I think our, our local society um, press officers really ought to look to their laurels. But it does give us some indication as to, and it's a genuine indication as to the, the growth and the falling away of organized stamp societies, largely in towns and small towns and cities and schools and so on in the country. And all of these, which I have not yet researched, do bear, do bear researching. And it's a huge hole in trying to look for our own history. There are other sources. I mean, here, the, the, the first history of the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain, the first four years. The Congress was sponsored by a number of, uh, of societies. And again, it's a good place to start looking. 
the who's who's in philosophy. There are many of these over the years. Uh, this one from 1914 uh, with the Oswald Marsh stamp dealer advertisement on the front is actually quite a good place to research for stamp societies and stamp uh, associations and philatelic clubs, etc. Exhibition catalogues are useful because in exhibition catalogues you quite often find societies sponsoring the exhibition. And not just the larger ones. Uh, quite often you're, you're surprised at who was supporting these exhibitions. Philatelic Congress of Great Britain yearbooks which run from, well, 1919-ish through to today, just about. But the heyday is in the 40s, 30, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, very useful sources for information about societies. There were philatelic societies handbooks. This one's from 1933. And uh, I think it's the fourth year of publication. And so the first one is supposed to be 1929, but I think it's 1931, but, um, and you can see that's published by Sidney A. R. Oliver of Torquay. They continued for a long time. This one's published by Stamp Collecting Limited in Buckingham Street. Um, but these list very often with the year of foundation, quite often with the number of members, sometimes with the names of officers, and always with interspersed advertisements and other bits of information, and they're fantastic sources for finding out what there was and when did it start. But it's still not complete. And not only that, given the inconsistency of the uh, producers of these things, they're not often internally consistent. So you can find societies beginning in different years with the same name. Uh, this one's later still. This is published by the British Philatelic Association. Philatelic Society's Yearbook, 64, 1964, 1965. And here's the British Philatelic Federation uh, Yearbook Directory from 1978. Again, they're not consistent. Moving on, the 86 Yearbook of the, Phil the Philatelic Society's Directory, produced by the British Philatelic Federation. I'll come on to these federations and associations in a moment. And then later, 1997-98, this is produced by the ABPS, but all the time they've been produced by volunteers and all the time it's sometimes very hard to decide which one's right and which one's not. Um, this we were given very recently, this is Milestones by the, the Sidcup Philatelic Society, thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you very much, <laughs> Jeff. Um, and uh, these are really useful um, and often correct uh, representations of the history of individual societies. And in the library, we have quite a lot of these. Or are they in the archive? Library. And then there's journals. We have a collection of published histories and runs, and quite often, seriously, the only extant set is to be found here in this institution. We, we, the Methodist Philatelic Society, which disbanded, or is in the process of disbanding, wanted to make sure we had a complete set. And it is our ambition to be the go-to place to find these, because here at least you can sit at a desk and you can read and you can work your way through and you can study our history. I mean, for example, we have the, the, the Association of Scots Philatelic, Philatelic Society's publications, the Scots Philatelist and Philately in Scotland, and many, many, many others. Nicola's in the process of producing what's essentially a finder's guide for what we have. Um, it's not imminent, but it is soon. I said, how many societies have there been? Well, I started making a list, and so far I've found 820 that have been at some time in existence. But these societies, as we saw with the Bead School Society, can be education-based. There are many more than this 10. This is a work in progress. They're enterprise-based. The Civil Service had its own stamp club. Midland Bank had its own stamp club. Um, British Rail 
had its own stamp club. And I believe all of these have now gone. And there is very little in the way of a record apart from the fact that they existed and then they didn't. There's one overseas society that, 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 that supported the Philatelic Congress in 1909. There are 550 local societies. By local societies, we, we mean geographically based societies, national societies, specialist societies, regional societies, largely federations of, of, of other local clubs. And as I say, we've got to 820. I would be surprised if we didn't get way above 1,250 and perhaps even more, which have existed in the United Kingdom or in Great Britain, because you start getting muddled in Ireland before 1922. And it, it, is, it is quite tricky to decide what belongs where, but we would like to create a list of all the societies that ever have been. It is tedious, but it's the spinal listing of what can help us then begin to add flesh to the history of uh, our enterprise. How many more? We don't know how many more. This is particularly about Great Britain, but of course, every other country, certainly in Europe and other parts of the world, have been on the same kind of journey that, uh, that we have. And here, the first society I think that ever existed, the so uh, Société Philatelique in Paris from January 1865. It lasted only until the end of 1865. The Philatelic Society of New York was founded in 67 by eight collectors, refounded after it failed in 1868, and that had ceased by the summer of 1869. And then there's us, the Philatelic Society London. Philatelic Society London very nearly faded into oblivion in the early 1870s, but it was rescued by um, Charles Viner and uh, Mrs. T Bay. T Bay. No, by, by, I think she's called T Bay. Um, and then elsewhere, again, very short lived, the Süddeutsche Philatelist Verein in Heidelberg, 1869 to 1870, and it failed. We are interested in these overseas societies, but I think we owe it to our own history to be able to at least tell the story of, 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 of British philatelic history. So general societies, sub clubs centered on towns and cities, regions and districts and specialist societies and workplace-based work work place and educationally-based clubs, national societies, including national federations, regional societies, including federations and associations. So it's a very large topic but you begin to understand that there was barely a community in Great Britain at some point in the last 150 years that hasn't had its own stamp club. And then, of course, there are international societies, which is yet another story. We have not touched on the trade, another part of philatelic history, nor of postal administrations, another part of philatelic history. So... It is worthwhile looking at the framework for um, organized philately because there is an international federation which has lost most of its own history. There are continental federations which have lost most of their own history. And there are national federations where at best we can say their history is mixed. So the FIP, founded in 1926, once upon a time it did have records in Switzerland, they've gone. FIAF, founded in 1968, FIAP, that's Inter-Asian Philately, 74, and FEPA in, in 89, and even FEPA, founded 30 years ago, is lacking much of its own history. We have some of it here, fortunately. And then the national federations, for example, the Dance Philatelist for Bund or um, Bund uh, Deutsche Philatelisten, 
uh, Farine and the Association of British, Phil uh, British Philatelic Societies, founded in 1997. And even that organization would find it hard pressed to present their own history. And this is a hierarchical situation where the federations and the continental federations in theory look up to the FIP, but in practice, they don't look up to the FIP. Uh, national federations, this is in the UK. I suppose we started with the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain in 1909 as a, what was then envisaged as a parliamentary body for philatelic clubs and societies. I believe it affiliated to the FIP in 1960. Yeah, and, and David Beach, who knows at least as much about this that I do, and probably far more, I found a single record which, which indicated that. The fact that neither is no. Probably 1970. No, no, it's a different, they did it twice. Ah, well, that would explain it. The yeah. Time, yeah. The Philippine Peer Exhibition wasn't no. affiliated. No, it at wasn't. Time. It wasn't, big, big discussion at the time. I, yeah, I, it's just extraordinary. Yeah. We don't know. The British Philatelic Association as an umbrella body, body was founded in 1926. It has a complicated history. It merged with the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain in 1976, I think. So you get the British Philatelic Federation. And then you have the ABPS in 1997. And this constant changing of organizational bases, I think, has made it very hard both for clubs and societies to regard the National Association in Great Britain with any great confidence. And secondly, um, it's meant it's been very easy for them to lose the records. This is another sideshow which is a trade body here, the British Philatelic, sorry, the Philatelic Protection Association, founded in 1891, largely anti-forgery, and the Stamp Trade Protection Association, 1900. And it was disbanded because the British Philatelic Association included uh, their area of, of, of membership and concern. And there it was founded in 1926, as I've said, and PCGB merged with the BPA to form the BPF. And the BPF, founded in 1976, fell into hard times in the 1980s, really fell apart in, if truth were told. So they ran into financial difficulties, ceased, op ceased operation, Virtually had to wind up in order to avoid bankruptcy, and then it became the ABPS from 1997. And again, this just underpins the difficulty in trying to hold together a history of our, our hobby. So that's rather depressing news in, in many respects. And, and I have to say, when I started to put this together, I, had, I was not aware that we were actually such an historical muddle. Um, I often get asked, since people have begun to discover that I've been looking into this, who was first? And I've had various clubs say, well, we weren't first because the Royal was the first, but we were first. Um, so here's the list of the first 10, I think, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, first 10. Um, you'd think this was pretty well known, who was founded when, or what was founded when. Um, this is the next 10, 1894 through to 1899. But only last week, the Bromley Amateur Philatelic Society appeared as founded in 1897. Its own history, until recently, says it was founded much later, 45. But there it is, and here is its rules, and there is the date of the first subs collections in 1897. So I have to tell you, we don't even know who the first two dozen were. 
And there's, here, here we go on to 1906. The Irish Philatelic Society, which was uh, with Ireland part of Great Britain in 1901, we have to include it. Um, and they're running up to 1908. I did the first 30 odd um, leading up to the first Philatelic Congress of Great Britain. So that was my cutoff point to try to find out who the early, early, um, uh, early starters were. Interestingly, these are all geographically based except for the International Philatelic Union, which is another story, the Junior Philatelic Society and the Royal. And the Philatelic Literature Society's, well, one of its many claims to fame is it was the first specialist society that I've been able to identify. So, the, and just the Junior Philatelic Society was, it was founded because the Royal Philatelic Society of London, well, it was called the Philatelic Society London at the time, with a comma, um, rejected Fred, Fred Melville's application because he was only 18. So he formed the Junior Philatelic Society, which is now the National Philatelic Society. And it was a huge success because I suspect the Royal was pretty, sorry, the Philatelic Society London was pretty stuck up about its membership. And, um, the Junior Philatelic Society capitalized on pent up demand for a philatelic society that anybody could join, wherever they were and whoever they were. And this was immensely successful because it actually started setting up branches and the Manchester Club, the Manchester Society did, began, I believe, as a branch of the Junior, as did Brighton and Liverpool and Scotland. Um, and I suspect there are others. I don't have a complete list. Okay, so that's a lot of words. Um, what can we collect? Because everybody here, I think, is a collector. I love these. I really love these. These are in our museum here. Um, this is Leicester Philatelic Society, 1907. Awarded to J. Reed Burton in Class 3 for... The class three is collections of 25 countries. Life was simpler in those days. Sound Collectors fortnightly, um, fortnightly medal on Transvaal, read before the Bath Philatelic Society. But these are silver. They're very nicely made. They're, there must be many, many, many of these in, 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 in collectors' hands, um, but they're hard to find. South Essex Philatelic Society, 1911. Um, the Walthamstow Exhibition. And we go, Dean MacDonald Jr. for his general collection. Or her general collection, but most likely his. North of England Philatelic Society. For C.L. Bagnall, for his services as Honorary Secretary of the Seventh Philatelic Congress, in Newcastle 1920, a very significant Congress in, in, in the history of organized philatelism. Croydon, 1932, SC Daft, Swedish varieties. Nottinghamshire, 1935, 1936, South Russia, H. Bert or Bert. Birmingham Philatelic Society to E.R. King, no relation, 1936-37. Kingston-upon-Thames, 1927 for F.H. Stringer. A very nice City of London Philatelic Society brand price for a philatelic display awarded 1953. And I think that brand prize, brand prize went on for some years longer into the 60s, maybe even, maybe even a little longer. Yeah. Um, and Bristol and Clifton, one of the interesting variations of the Bristol Society, 1978. So these, make, these, these medals run on really from the early part of the 20th century until the 1970s. And now we only see them rarely in any kind of um, valuable metal 
and very rarely in such quantities from so many different places. I suspect there are very, very many more of these to be recorded. And uh, our record of these is, well, somewhere between pitiful and hopeful. Uh, this was given to us recently, very recently. This is the Manchester Central Philatelic Society's um, session from 1937-38. You can see it's founded 1906. And this is the program card. They used to meet at the Central Library, Manchester. You can see the president is uh, M. Swift. That's Lillian Swift, who's a member of the Royal. It's her grandfather who was president of the society. So thank you, Lillian, for this. I, I love this, which is um, Stephen, one of the final, one of the finest coronation airmail and general stocks in the north for anything philatelic. And there's Bridger and Kay, the name that's with us still today, under a new management. But it's amazing how many different businesses in Philately have continued. And I saw a, a sale uh, by Plumridge only the other day. Now, Plumridge is a 19th century uh, trading organization that occasionally still holds an auction. Uh, but you get the committee members and you discover they've got a forgery society. And here's the Sam Collector's Fortnightly, edited by Fred Melville. Fred Melville is one of the most important philatelic figures in, I think, world philately, certainly in philately in the English-speaking world, both for his publications and his organizational skill and his skill in organizing exhibitions. Um, but you can see the program, Presidential Address and Paper by Mr. M. Swift. And then uh, it's, it's entirely recognizable. An advertisement for Albert, Al, by Albert H. Harris, edited the Philatelic Magazine, Thrupence, recognized by the majority as the best stamp newspaper and more of the program. I love this one. This is a well northern thing. 8 Patton Street, Piccadilly, Manchester. Stamp collectors don't pay fancy prices. That's Haywards. Go to Haywards for stamp dealers the oldest dealers in the city. As I said at the very beginning, the, the dealers is a very patchy history. More of the society's uh, program, more of the society's program and its rules, and its rules, and it's, they're, they're lovely and they are, they encapsulate uh, a place and a time and a group of people and what they were up to uh, as part of our ancestry. Scandinavia Philatelic Society Program 2020. We're interested in holding these as well. So age is immaterial. It's their existence because these are absolutely ephemeral and disappear. GBPS, um, wonderful society with a fabulous website, uh, program and rules. Um, from 2020-21, this season. So we're interested in everything and anything, to be truthful. It's where Nicola's sighing over there because they all have to be um, recorded and uh, added to our catalogues. Um, this is lovely. Um, this is a penny black letter addressed to Roland Hill. Um, but it's the Brighton and Hove Philatelic Society founded 1906. Mm. Come to that. This is from 1957-58. British Airmail Society, I was given this pretty recently to, for the club, for the society. Dublin Stamp Society, 2008, thanks to Frank Walton. Yorkshire Philatelic Association with the White Rose. These two are very ephemeral. Kent Federation, Isle of Thanet Philatelic Society, 75th anniversary. Stamp Show, Merseyside, 75th anniversary. If we don't collect these things, they are going to disappear absolutely. Letterbox Study Group. I found a city guide the other day who had heard of the Letterbox, letterbox Study Group because he uses its literature to describe the letterboxes that he passes on his walks. To, with tourists in the city of London. This is a series of postcards. Um, this is the Philatelic History Society, fabulous 
organization organized by Victor Short and it stops now. Um, and uh, I don't know why it stops. And I don't know what happened to their collections. And I don't even know what happened to Victor's um, collection of material. Sheffield Philatelic Society paperweight. So 3D objects we, we collect. So that's a whole range of things. Recently, we received the Brighton and Sussex Philatelic Society's minute books. We are very interested in minute books. This is fabulous. Brighton and Sussex Philatelic Society, founded in 1891, the 16th of November, 1891. Now you see Brighton and Hove was founded in 1906. And here, right at the very beginning, proposed by Mr. Gillespie and seconded by the Reverend E.H. Rogers, that they create a, agree to the uh, formation of a philatelic society under the name of the Brighton and Sussex Philatelic Society, 1891. And here we have the Brighton and Sussex Philatelic Society, <coughs> President M.P. Castle. Uh, quite a lot of luminaries were members of this Brighton and Sussex Philatelic Society. And here's a, the, the latest minute book we have, 5th of January 1904. And you can see that they agree unanimously on that date that the Brighton Philatelic Society is hereby dissolved. Now, the interesting thing is, well, it's, perhaps it's not interesting, but it's a fact, in 1891, it called itself the Brighton and Sussex Philatelic Society, and only a handful of years later, it called itself the Brighton Philatelic Society. So tracking down the history of these places is fun, to say the least. The Hearts Philatelic Society's many books came to us at the same time. Uh, the Hearts Philatelic Society was um, a very upmarket society. Um, these minute books include newspaper cuttings about the society. I just love these. Um, there we go. Queen Mary as head waitress. This is uh, 1917. And what's happened is that the Hearts Philatelic Society has funded a soup kitchen in the East End of London, which is opened by Queen Mary and Princess Christians waiting at table with these urchins. urchins. But it reads already that St. Andrew's Hospital, Dollis Hill, is indebted to the collectors for an X-ray installation. So they funded an X-ray installation at a hospital during the First World War. And here we have um, Queen Mary and some of the urchins who were being served from East London. You notice that the lad on the left of the picture uh, on stage right actually is barefoot. But the Queen had many, the Queen had many funny experiences with her child customers. But here's a philatelic society running a soup kitchen, funding a soup kitchen, <laughs> funding a, uh, an x-ray um, <coughs> set up in, the, in, in, in Dollis Hill. And then you read on and you come to various things that, well, I didn't know. This is about the Belgian families who were refugees. During the First World War between 1914 and 1918, approximately one million Belgians fled across the border to the Netherlands. Little could have prepared, little could have prepared Folkestone for 14th October 1914, when 16,000 Belgian refugees arrived in a single day. I don't think Pretty Patel's got a problem. Refugees continue to arrive almost daily for months and 250,000 Belgian refugees came to Britain during World War I. Now what's this to do with the Hearts Philatelic Society? Well, they paid for a hut, a house, a refugee house in Appledorn, uh, sorry, Elizabeth Dorp, um, in the Netherlands, which is where some of these refugees were staying. And here's interned soldiers at work in this refugee village. And here is the house that was funded by the Hearts Philatelic Society. Um, the Hearts Philatelic Hut in Elizabeth Dorp 
near Amerfort in Holland. Yeah, presented to the Belgian Re Repatriation Fund by the Hearts Philatelic Society. And here in the center says donation gift to Hearts Philatelic Society. So uh, extraordinary. I didn't know anything about this until we started going through the minute books. You might think I've forgotten the royal, but I have left it more or less till last. Um, this is a piece that is not ours. It's uh, one of our members has come across it. And this is a, an invitation to um, attend the dinner of the Philatelic Society in 1897. And uh, there's a lot of this kind of material around, but most of it, we don't have samples, examples of here at all. And we should, I think we should. So to go back, why is it important to preserve these artifacts? Well, this was done by Barry Stagg and Richard Smith uh, earlier this year. And they looked at the number of societies affiliated to the ABPS. And you can see in 2006, 295 societies with a total of 9,627 members. 2020, that's 175 societies and 4,802 members. So a 41% fall in the number of societies. And COVID has added to that a 51% fall in the number of members affiliated to organized philatelic bodies which are affiliated to the ABPS, which I'm beginning to think is a very much a minority sport because there are plenty of collectors out there. You've only got to look at eBay and you've only got to look at, well, there are plenty more collectors out there. 24 of the existing societies have fewer than 10 members. 89 societies have fewer than 20 members. So two caveats. The first is that not all societies are affiliated to the ABPS and not all collectors by far are members of societies. And you have only to speak privately to um, the trade and you'll find out that some dealers have got more individuals on their own individual mailing lists than are, affili than are affiliated to the ABPS. So. The interest in what we do is not dying, but organized philately is very much a shadow of itself, of its former self. So I believe, and I'm sure you will agree, that unless we here in this building build our museum and library collections, many elements of our philatelic enterprise over the last 150 years will be lost for all time. So my question is, and we'll do a bit more on this, is there any interest in forming a clubs and society study group at the Royal to try to get a handle on this and bring some of this material together and actually put a research program together? Incidentally, we need to do the same thing for philatelic, philatelic exhibitions. I mean, there are some huge pieces of work to be done. And now we've got some reasonable premises and we're in hopefully coming out of COVID. We've got a chance to start to think about how are we going to hold this together for the future. So if anybody's interested, that's my email address, which is not complicated, kingc at rpsl.org.uk. And just one other little thing here. Um, these are Copenhagen for the tele Teleclub long service pins. And I just put it in at the end, just to remind you that we're interested in overseas material as well. The, the Philatelic Club in um, Copenhagen is interesting because it was originally branch, uh, originally a branch of the uh, International uh, Philatelic Union of Dresden. And many European clubs, including Edinburgh, I believe, were started life as branches of the um, of the, uh, the, the Philatelist and Verein in Dresden. So that's me. Thank you very much for your attendance.
and I'm done. So, Mike, are you in charge of the next bit? Can't sleep, I'm sorry. We've got a couple of questions, if you can hear me, no. uh, or a couple of comments. Um, Steve Harrison pointed out that the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain Handbook runs from 1909. Yep. Um, Abhishek uh, said the main reason for the paltry references to philatelic societies in British newspaper archives from 1950 to 1999, particularly 2000 to 2021, is that these periods have relatively fewer newspapers scanned. Uh, so there's no doubt that even if they were, the average number of references might be lower, but that's for information. Well, well, Yours? Just to say, what I think is that the numbers are wrong. Um, Abhishek also pointed out that Ch Charlotte T. Bay was no. the first female member of the Royal Phil of the Philatelic Society London, mm -hmm. elected in, in 1876. You know, in the record, there's a a very mysterious reference which refers to a lady in New Zealand. As, and she's the earliest member of the Philatelic Society of London. But we don't know her name, we don't know where she lived, so I'll have to accept that Charlotte Tebay was, uh, was the first member for whom we have a name. Okay. Um, okay, so a couple more points. I don't know if you can see the chat. Do you want to look at those? Yeah. I'm being corrected by Frank Walton as usual, since she was a notable lady of New Zealand. Yeah. Sounds like the first line of a limerick, doesn't it? Really? Yes. Um, Brian Stone Street um, has a message that the British Railways Philatelic Society is still in existence, but only just. Um, and so is the Civil Service Society. Okay, thank you. Didn't know that. Okay. Um, I mean, the truth is, what I don't know could fill this room. What I do know, you've more or less got on this slideshow. So there's a huge amount of stuff we don't know. And I think unless we can get a group to start to pull this history together and to really start to put together a program of research over the next five or, five or 10 years, um, we are going to lose it. And which is why I'm suggesting, and I'd be interested to know what people think about having a study group, um, simply to try to put together a program of of research and action. Other more questions there? Uh, yes, Julian Jones has asked, uh, do you want digital copies of minutes, leaflets, etc.? Um, that might open a floodgate, which I'm sure you're happy to deal with. I think what we would like is um, copies by the year, yes. Um, individual copies as they come, please <laughs> note. However kind the offer is, um, I can see Nicola freezing in her seat. <laughs> okay. so, I mean, we really, it's, it's such a thin collection in such a rich field that um, we should be embarrassed, or rather our predecessors should be embarrassed about what they didn't do. But perhaps it wasn't important then. Well, that's the end of the questions. Good. So, okay. David Beach. I really did think that the way forward in this, I think it's an excellent idea. We should have been able to do it. Bibliography. And I'm very keen on it. But I'm going to find out the information that really exists. But all those other questions you posed today has to start off with the literature and that we can do it. Clearly, we may just start on that prime march, urge, I hope go. Yep. Um, we must keep building this in a never ending task. Um, if there's a separate publication, you have to remember that literature is, well, it's a literature, like all literature, is divided into monographs and serials, monographs being one of them, serials being the two of them. What we apparently got, uh, in fact, are monographs, one of them. They are much easier to find. Serials, magazines, where we're going to find a lot of smaller references to them. The absolutely key to finding the way forward. And, and, it, and it's, um, if you like, just making a list of what exists. 
we very largely done in many areas. But you just then keep picking in between those journals. Um, I think I'd make one point um, about one magazine in particular, and that is the magazine Stamp Collector, started in 1913. Um, and it's particularly important for the specialist societies, which really started after the Second World War. And if you look to see who was actually managing and running and doing and encouraging this was stamp collection through Ken Chapman from the early 1950s, his work with the BPI. Um, Ken Chapman also has been given a, a big award because he did more for black in the United Kingdom than I think any other person ever. Absolutely exceptional well. The other thing to bear in mind is that we have flowering of black leaf that took place and ending, if you like, in 1980. If you look back to the Edwardian philatelic exhibitions, you'll find Reverend Baker recorded it so brilliantly. It was at the exhibition that was in 19, whatever it was. 06. 06 had 4,123 people attending it. Now, we go to the 1980 exhibition, we reckon there was probably 100,000. So in fact, we had a wonderful flowering during that, that period. And essentially, that's been killed off by a great deal of bad things, like stamp investment and other things like that. I think that has to be part of the story too. Mm. What David's been saying, I don't know whether people outside the room heard what they did you, did you hear any of that, Mike? We heard most of it. It was a little bit garbled at a, a couple of pieces. But I mean, what David's saying is, yes, we really ought to start with something, well, begin with a bibliography of what exists. And in fact, that's very much what Nick's been doing for the last little while in trying to put together a simple list of what we have, um, because we have much more than's on your list. Though, of course, there's going to be stuff that's on, on David's list that we don't have on ours. So, producing that definitive list of literature, which is actually quite difficult because it includes what you call grey material, which is stuff which is actually neither a monograph nor a serial, but is relevant. Um, so, uh, and David also pointed out the, the value of stamp collecting which you can buy complete runs off for very little money today, because I have one, we have one here in the library. And Frank Walton, I think, is running through one at the moment, doing um, uh, a research into something which you remind me of on chat in a moment. Um, so, so yes, David's really just encouraging us to, 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 to crack on with it. And I think, I really think that we should before, well, oh, before really it becomes an almost impossible, it's a very difficult task now, and I do believe it will become impossible. Frank Walton, he's been working on building a cumulative index for stamp collecting. And that will be very helpful. Anybody else got anything to solve? Sounds like we don't. Well, I I think, um, am I done? Right. I think we are. I think we are done. If, um, I'll pass back to Chris to close off. Yep. Or Nicola. Hi, thanks very much, Chris. Um, just a couple of points to say. Um, firstly, thanks very much to John Stimson and to Mike Hoffman, who have been dealing with all the technology, and we're still quite new to doing the uh, hybrid meetings. So, uh, any comments, then uh, please, uh, any feedback, pass it on to us. And uh, the other thing, for those at Abchurch today or visiting in the next couple of months, um, we've got some of the objects relating to Chris's talk on display in the Members' Lounge. Um, and as Chris said, the um, presentation will be available on the website to have, a, have another look at. And any queries about donations or anything held here, um, then email us at research at rpsl.org.uk. Um, and thank you very much. Good afternoon. Okay.